Hello, welcome to Connie Martinson Talks Books. The music of America will never be the same because there was a company called Motown in Detroit. Well, the number one stars of Motown, The Temptations. My guest today, Otis Williams, has written the book Temptations, and it's about the story of how he thought of the name and success and the price of success in America. It's published by Putnam, and we'll be back after a short pause with Otis Williams. Welcome back. We're talking with Otis Williams, author of Temptations, published by Putnam. And welcome, Otis. Thank you. I cannot tell you what a thrill it is for me for someone who has listened to my girl. That's and I mean, I have no sound, no rhythm. But to see you is to see the group, the movement, and the image in one's mind. Well, I guess that's what uh, we're all about, trying to you know, tap on all the senses you know, that God gave us. And uh, that's what we've been to, uh, trying to do for 28 years. When you say God's gave us. You say something about the music in the book being like church music of, what is it, chorus and recall. It, it is, uh, the expression was um, about the type of music having um, almost the religious feeling. Oh, sure. Well, see, when you were, you know, born in the South and raised up with uh, every Sunday having to go to church and spend all day in church and in the process of getting ready to go to church, you were listening at the radio, and at that time they were playing like Sam Cooke and the Soul Stirs and the Dixie Hummingbirds and the Highway QC's Five Blind Boys. You, you know, that become like ingrained within you. And uh, I guess by and large you carry that through life with you, and especially if you are a singer and uh, you start singing, it's uh, part of your makeup and it becomes like a a part of uh, once you start singing contemporary uh, music, you always have that kind of uh, uh, rudiments in you. Uh, the expression I was looking for, because I loved it, was call and response. Well, that's uh, something that uh, you know we just always call on you yeah. know, because it's there, and uh, it has helped us through uh, us, uh, you know, singing and uh, trying to make records that will kind of give a real good. Uh, impression of what we're about as far as, you know, uh, people from the South and uh, having that kind of background. And uh, just about everybody at Motown, yeah. you know, had that kind of a uh, religious up, uh, upbringing. But, come on, Otis, there is a point in the book where who is it who gives you the advice about you got to make the women want you? No, oh, Paul. Yeah. Well, he yeah. had the same kind of background, even yeah. though he was wa uh, wise beyond his young years, you know. Paul had another kind of... Uh, uh, sensitivity and wisdom, you know, and true. At first, when we first started singing, we were just noted for standing there and singing. But he said, "Now, well, we just can't just stand there and sing because we sing good. We got to sell sex and move because the women like to see that kind of thing." And I was kind of surprised because I like that, but I, I've always been the kind like when we would go out, my middle name would be Wallflower because I would be up against the wall watching everybody else dance. So I was telling him, "Well, Paul, I'm stiff as a box of gold yeah. starch. I can't do all that." But uh, he had faith and confidence and uh, worked with me and uh, Eddie and the rest of the guys. And, uh, you know, it's now a mainstay of IAC. And including, he, who was the one who came up with the purple uh, uniforms? Oh, Eddie Kendricks. Eddie, yeah. was, uh, he was in charge of the uniforms. And because uh, Eddie has always been a very, uh, very good dresser. And uh, we put him in charge of it. And so we were in New York City at the Apollo. And um, a young man by the name of uh, Dave from F and F Clothes would come by with swatches, and he had these different color swatches. And Eddie, you know, him and Eddie were going over, and so Eddie picked out the purple one. And I said, "Well, man, I'm a little too dark for all that purple." And uh, next thing you know, uh, we tried it, and that was the talk of uh, of New York City. All oh, the temptations in those purple outfits and what have you. So. Uh, then we started to become noted for the flashy uh, stage wear. Otis, you say being too dark, black, what have you. What about racism? That was an era of civil rights, civil movements, mm -hmm. and Martin Luther King. Absolutely. Well, it was very prevalent. I mean, because we encountered quite a bit of it. 
uh, during our earlier days of uh, traveling on the Motortown Review tours, Henry Wynn tours, and what have you. And uh, I never will forget a couple of incidents that uh, went down. We were in South Carolina and we were getting ready to perform. So our crew, they were setting up the band stand and the microphone and the, the PA system. And so we always make it a point to come and scan the audience, you know, mm -hmm. from backstage, people around the curtain. So as I'm doing this, I noticed a rope right down the center of the auditorium. I said, wow, I wonder what's that for? And uh, once we started performing, you know, we saw blacks on one side, whites on the other. Same thing in the balcony, you know, and so we found it kind of hard to perform. But we came back to that same auditorium a year later, and blacks and whites were sitting side by side, slapping each other five, talking about, oh, wow, the show was dynamited, hugging each other. It brought tears to eyes, you know, because yeah. you could see that change uh, within that short amount of time. During that period, did you ever go to Mississippi or any of the other really? Uh Oh yeah, we played the South quite fluent. Uh, Mississippi, I never will forget there again. Ole Miss, and it was the last year that Archie Manning uh, was getting ready to come out and go to play professional ball for the New Orleans Saints. And there again, we were coming to perform there, and uh, I guess uh, the black folks said, oh wow, the tips is coming. You know, we're gonna get right down front this time. But they didn't have the tickets to uh, mm -hmm. sit there. So the white people came and they had uh, tickets, uh, you know, for them to sit there. So it was an eyeball, eyeball confrontation. Yeah. So Eddie Kendricks and myself, we saw this. So we came out from backstage and came up to the, uh, uh, to the stage over the microphone and said, please do not do this. We came to perform for people regardless. So those who have the sit, uh, tickets to sit where they're supposed to sit, please go and sit mm -hmm. at those uh, uh, seats. And they listened to us, you know, uh, and uh, they backed down and black folks went and sat in their uh, seats and the white people sat in their mm -hmm. uh, seats. So it made me say that, uh, whoa, you know, they listened at us beyond the music that we made. Yeah. You know, and it just shows you that music can be used for a far-reaching platform rather than just getting out there being uh, doing what we're noted to do. So uh, uh, there was some shocking moments and we had a, a guitarist at the time Bill Neal, he was a white boy that uh, about 19 or 20 years old, and that was the first time he had ever seen that. And he was standing on stage so that he, he was holding the guitar fret and the, uh, the neck of the guitar so hard uh, and strong that all the color just yeah. came out of his hands because he was petrified. Yeah. He had never seen that. So uh, we've had some uh, uh, shocking because realities. Because when you were doing that at that time, you the, the troop, the temptations, as we said earlier, a little bit, you were selling sex as well as the sound, and it was the juices coming up. Uh, to be doing that in the South could be a little bit threatening. Well, it's all in uh, how you do it. We have never been a vulgar. No, act, yeah. No. We would always do it with a, a large amount of class, but still subtle. You know, never the thing of just really getting out there and doing a crass move or two illicit ways. You say, oh, wow, well, come on, gee, that's, that's a little too vulgar. Yeah. So we never would take it to that extent. But it was the kind of moves that when you would see it, you would appreciate it and say, oh, it's done in good taste. Yeah. So we were uh, taught that, you know, like I said, Cha uh, um, Paul Williams, who was the first one to mm -hmm. initiate us into uh, choreography, and then um, uh, Charlie Atkins and La yeah. Fontaine, they would come along. Uh, Otis, later. we're going to take a short pause. When we come back, well, let's go back into Motown, Barry Gordy, and almost as if it was a finishing school for you, the Absolutely. Supremes, and the chaperoning. We'll be back after a short pause with Otis Williams, author of Temptations, published by Putnam. <laughs> Welcome back. We're talking with Otis Williams, author of Temptations, published by Putnam. Otis, we, we mentioned earlier Barry Gordy and Motown, and that you had to behave a certain way. He didn't just say, go loose. Well, I really would have to give more credit to Charlie Atkins, Lon Fontaine, Maurice King, Harvey Fuqua, because even though it was Barry's uh, you know, company and all, uh, Harvey Fuqua came to Barry 
and approached him about we should have like a finishing school. So I guess Barry was receptive enough to give uh, uh, Harvey the green light to go and recruit these guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when they finally set up artist development, uh, Charlie and the guys that I mentioned, they would sit and tell us about how we should be not only when we are on stage, but how we should carry ourselves when we're not on stage because they uh, both are important. You know, you just don't want people to look at you in a one-dimensional sense that, oh great, they're good on stage, but they are nothing off stage. They mm -hmm. do not know how to act and carry themselves as, as people off stage. So they would tell us how to, you know, be professional off stage, how to dress, and you know. It and was you were there. kids, you were young. And we needed that. Yeah. You needed that. But with it came also Big Daddy. I mean, he took the money, he doled out allowances, uh, there was, there's the in-between stage of when you're grown up, almost like a, a book I was reading about the movie studios in the day, the heydays yeah, right. of the Chiefs. Right. Uh, you know, you had a contract and if you suddenly were a great success, tough luck, you still had a, there wasn't, well, when he won't let you have your own publishing uh, house. Oh, that's true, that's true. Uh, well, and I know he did the, uh, passing out to some of the artists. The temptation, I guess he looked at us in the sense, well, these are young men, and it's only so much governing I can do when it comes to, like, their money. We were pretty much in control of our own money, yeah. along with being bowls. But uh, uh, that's true, you know, in the areas of uh, the publishing. No, he was, uh, you know, no publishing. You know, it was uh, unheard of to even think about publishing, not only uh, uh, the publishing, but uh, uh, he didn't want us to write. You know, and when the Temptations first came to Motown, our first two singles we had written, you know, Oh Mother Man and Check Yourself. So it was not a thing of like a little play toy. We had been writing mm -hmm. uh, prior to, but uh, I guess uh, he knew the, the real uh, thing of what the publishing and writing uh, meant. So he just said, no, we just wanted you to, we want you to be the artist. Because I never will forget one day he was coming up the walkway going to his office. And you know, we've already had mm -hmm. this rapport uh, on a uh, very good, friendly basis. So I, I come, uh, comes up to him and I said, how you doing, Barry, so and so and so. I said, you know, when we're in town, Barry, I'd like to write, you know, cause uh, uh, I want to get back to that. Oh, no, 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 I don't want you to write. Uh, you just be an artist. We have people to write for you. I uh, don't want you to write. Uh, I said, well, Barry, uh, I'm gonna be an artist, you know, but when we off, sometimes we would be off for like two or three weeks mm -hmm. at, at a time and uh, I would like to get in the studio and, uh, you know, write. No, 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 you know, you, you can't do that. And uh, he was very absolute and matter of fact about it. And it kind of busted my bubble there for a minute because I couldn't understand where he was coming from because like I said, we had already written some. Yeah. And uh, so it wasn't like, well, you guys, you, you don't know nothing about no writing. So it was a thing that uh, we learned then that, uh, oh, when you start making money, people can change and start taking on a different kind of attitude. Otis, when he said that to you about don't write, did, did it nip it in the bud or did you still write at home or still write? I mean, how do you uh, stop not writing? Well, you don't stop if you believe in yeah. yourself and it's something that you want to, uh, want to do. Uh, for a minute, I was kind of like uh, waylaid, you know, and I had to get back. I said, oh, no, I'm not going to let him or anyone else stop me from what I, I really want to do. And uh, here recently, you know, last few years, uh, the Treater Like a Ladies and the Truly For Yous and Touch Me and a few others we have written and uh, have uh, some success. And now we have a split publishing deal with Motown, you know, so. Uh, so if you live long enough, you can oh, get yeah. there, yeah. Yeah, we believe in that, that bit of being like a constant drop of water on a slab of iron, you know, after a while that iron's going to give way, you know, uh, and start rusting. So, that's our theory. We say, yeah, we'll just keep on patting until you say, all right, give these guys uh, a, a publishing deal. And when we re-signed in 1980, that's how we got it, because we uh, stressed it. When you talk about being strong and having an ideal, that was your idea, too, that nobody was really a star. It was the temptations that any one of you could be a lead singer. Well, we had always uh, uh, built uh, our, our act as different guys in the group could step up and take a lead. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, that was something we were very proud of. I was probably the one that didn't do that much leading because 
my aid don't necessarily run that way. My aid was as long as all five of us are being successful and things are happening, I'm satisfied. Yeah. You know, so, uh, but uh, I did have my, you know, times when I would step up and leave. Yeah. But we pride ourselves on uh, uh, being able to uh, uh, sing just about anything, and that's why we did albums like uh, Chimps in a Mellow Mood, to show that uh, we could sing other than the regular contemporary R&B pop kind of flavorings, but tunes that had a, a, another kind of a substance and uh, longevity. Yeah, because you also did recording of old standards. Yes. But Otis, we're going to take a short pause. When we come back, could I ask you to hum anything? We'll be back with Otis Williams, author of Temptations, published by Putnam. Welcome back. We're talking with Otis Williams, author of Temptations, published by Putnam. Otis, what's the last, what's the most recent song that you have written, composed? Uh, Treat her like a lady. And that's one that Ollie Woodson and myself wrote, and uh, he sang lead on it. And uh, it's something that I'm very proud of because it, it uh, kind of let the women know that there are guys that's still around that believe in treating them as such because, you know, being out on the road and talking uh, to women, you know, you would always hear, you know, guys, they don't know how to treat women and they, this and that. So Ollie and me, we sat out and we came up with the idea of treat her like a lady to let them know that there are guys like that. And uh, my pipe's in very bad shape if you're talking about me singing. I, would, I, would I ask you, would I dream of it? Yeah. Yes, of course I would, but I can understand. Yeah, we yeah. have been on uh, uh, this book tour and I uh, uh, kind of raspy on the real side. And, yeah. Uh, I just rather not uh, do anything. In this I show. understand, and you can understand why I would love to hear it. Mm. So we, we'll we'll call it a Mexican standoff oh, okay. on that. All right. But when you say treat her like a lady, the groupies, mm -hmm. uh, some of those stories in the book about the ladies who lady I don't know if they're ladies, but the women whose husbands came banging on the door saying that's my woman and they get her out, and the one who said well I'll see you later, and you said oh no way. That's right. Some rough stories to tell about that one, you know. Uh, yeah, we were in Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, I'm getting off this bus, tour bus, and uh, it was Paul Williams' cousin. And as I'm stepping off the bus, she said, "Ooh, Paul, that's the one I like. I like him. I like him." Mm, Paul. So Paul calls me over. He said, "Otis, this is my cousin, and she, she like to meet you." And uh, I said, "Hi, my name is Otis." She said, "Yes, I know. And what are you doing after the show?" So now, mind you, I'm like 22 at the time. The eyes go and, tilt. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I said, well, you know, after the show, we're just going to come back and just rest because we're leaving yeah. early to go uh, to our next engagement. So uh, she said, well, can I come by? I said, well, yeah, I guess it's all right. And, but she, uh, uh, her husband had just gotten out of uh, Vietnam, and he was very high strong. And so she was saying that she was going to take care of her situation. Don't worry about it. I'll be there. Mm. So anyway. Tyrone Burston, uh, Smokey Robinson's nephew, him and I were sitting there and we were listening to that tape. So true enough, she came by and uh, so we're sitting there listening to that tapes and talking and all of a sudden we heard on the door, bam, 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 open the door, MF, I know she's in there. Oh, <laughs> I said, is that your, she said, oh, that's my husband, that's my husband. And uh, I said, well, I thought you, she said, I, I don't know how he found that. Then he bammed on the door again. Open the door, I'm going to kick this son of a gun down. So hmm. all of a sudden, it was just, uh, yeah. uh, uh, he just stopped. So when, uh, you know, he stopped, we eased up to the door, and he was gone. I got her out of there, <laughs> and uh, I switched rooms, and I said, no, nah, never again. No. So, you know, but, you know, when you're young, you know, sometimes you do certain things, and you look back and say, no, no, no. It's yeah. not worth that, so uh, I curtailed that a long time ago. Yeah. Otis, in the book you talk about, I mean, it is very hard to keep a group together with success. Uh, when you're struggling, you each are all grateful. What happens with a group as the money starts to come in and the, the guy who puts his name on the big limo and no longer is part of the group when, when the group really has been the star? Well, you know, Success. I guess I'm talking about Dave. Yeah. Yeah. You know, success, ha you know, has a very unique way of testing us all. You know, and when you 
come from not having money on a regular basis and then you start handling money mm -hmm. on a very consistent basis and all kind of things, wonderful things are happening to you. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, you can get bent out of shape and start thinking different and acting different and lose that uh, uh, kind of unity that you had at the beginning when you didn't have all that. And uh, it started to be a strain, you know, with David uh, and the rest of us. And uh, at that time, he had his limo and the Timps had a limo. Mm -hmm. Then we had a station wagon and uh, I guess he just chose to uh, drive his own uh, limo mm -hmm. and he had his name on the side and what have you. So we hated to see that because we had made a vow at the beginning that we were going to stay together. But you know, like I said, regardless of how talented yeah. one might be, you're still dealing with people first and foremost. And yeah. uh, we learned that. And uh, You and Mel seem to be the, the two stalwarts who went through the whole era together. Yes. Yeah, Melvin has been a pillar of strength for me and I, I would like to thank f uh, me uh, for him because we've gone through quite a few changes and uh, uh, quite a few tests and we're still uh, around and like I say, uh, we ping pong off of one another. So we've been uh, uh, hanging in there through all the many different adversities aside from all the good times as well. But uh, yeah, him and I have been together for about 30 some years now. We're gonna take a short pause, Otis. When we come back, I'd like to talk about, I suppose, again, Motown, it's moved to LA. Okay. And was Diana Ross really the one who should have been the big star out of the Supremes? Okay. We'll be back with Otis Williams, author of Temptations, published by Putnam. Welcome back. We're talking with Otis Williams, author of Temptations, published by Putnam. Otis, of the women in the Supremes, because you were involved at the same era. At right. one point, you even did a show together. Who was guess. it? Shelley Berg? Shelley Berger. Who put you together on that tour? Sure. Uh, at that time, the Supremes could do no wrong. You know, at that time, they had like uh, seven number one hits uh, uh, in a row. You know, and uh, so Motown wanted to capitalized on that with some of the other artists and uh, Shelley Berger uh, came on the scene in 1966. He's still your manager. And he's still our manager today. And so it, they developed the thing of uh, like uh, what we call pilly, uh, piggybacking. Uh, you cannot have the Supremes if you don't take the Temptations. Mm -hmm. So it was that kind of thing. So if the promoter wanted the uh, Supremes, he had to take the Temps. That was to get us exposed to that uh, mass uh, white yeah. audience that they had and uh, so it was the kind of thing that they used to you know wedge certain doors. Was Diana Ross that much of an innate star when they were starting? Well at the very beginning see we we go a long way back when there was four of them and yeah. they used to be called the primates and um, Florence Ballard in my opinion was a very very good singer she just didn't really get a a chance to shine and I think that might have been a, a tip of the iceberg what started her to feeling a certain way because uh, Diana always had the, you know the showman and the voice as well but Florence had another kind of thing I never will forget they used to do this uh, da -do -day, Ray Charles thing mm -hmm. night and day and then there was a high part where uh, uh, one of the Raylettes would come in so Florence took that part mm -hmm. in the primates and you know we were at the cabaret one day and People, you know, after a while, they start buzzing and talking and getting on. But when Florence would come in with that that high part, you know, yeah. a hush would come over the place. Yeah. She's like, "My God, who is this? That yeah. girl can sing." Magic you know, voice. Yeah, she had that kind that really cut through and would grab your attention. So, um, you know, she definitely had a voice and the talent to uh, to do some. But she didn't seem to have, according to your book, Barry Gordy's interest as much as say Diana No, did. I think Barry, I don't know the full thing of it, but I would uh, be safe in saying I think he felt that Diana had the more commercial sound far as getting the, the uh, pop airplay because Diane didn't have the, see Florence had more or less the, the churchy yeah. grit kind of thing. Diana was more like a uh, pop, you know, mm -hmm. singing with the, uh, so I guess he felt crossover. Though, yeah, had the yeah. crossover feel, and I figured, uh, I guess he figured that uh, she had the, the sound that was uh, uh, necessary for them to break through. 
Otis, what do you see coming in your sound now? Is it changing much? Well, I see right now that there is a void that needs to be filled, you know, far as good music, because I'm not that impressed with what, uh, with what I'm hearing on the radio nowadays. Uh, because, like, uh, I'm from an era where it's uh, song substance and great lyrical content, yeah. great melodies and, and things were constructed, whereas now uh, it seems like uh, guys that's writing and producing now don't stress that more so than just trying to come up with something to uh, be commercial enough to sell, but not of the commerciality of where songs will stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, our music has, you know, have done that because yeah. you're speaking of uh, 20 years and it's nothing to hear like on the Olympics, in between the Olympics when they had American yeah. Express, they had, I've got sunshine on a cloudy day. That's 20 years ago, but our music still stands. So I hope it comes back to that. Smokey Robinson in your career, was is he still a friend? Oh, yes. Yeah, we yeah. see Smokey uh, from time to time. He's working quite a bit now, and um, uh, we last saw him this past June. Was it difficult for him to be writing music for you people when he was also performing himself? I mean, is there a conflict of, hey, I'm giving my best away? No, not necessarily, because... Uh, uh, he was making money, you know, uh, on the Miracles as well as the Timps, and uh, he was a producer, so, you know, when you wear that kind of hat, you have to do the right thing and uh, yeah. come up with the best material for whomever you're recording for, you know, so uh, I don't think it posed any real conflict of interest, uh, knowing Smokey like I do. He's just that kind of uh, gentleman, whereas he knew what he was doing, and the best tune would go on the temps and the best tune for the miracles would go for them. So he wrote for each artist yeah. uh, in mind for that, that kind of song. Otis, thank you. I mean, I think the book really, apart from even the music, is a period in America of young people growing and changing and what's the best, surviving. And thank you very much. And let's see. Um, how to treat a lady? Treat her well, like a lady. treat her like a lady. That's right. Will you autograph my book I'd for be me? Glad to. And if you'd like a copy of our publication, Good Books, write to me, Connie Martinson, P.O. Box 69, 1640, Los Angeles, California at 90069, or look for our column in the California Press Bureau's eight newspapers, Beverly Hills Today, Palm Springs, Orange County. We'll tell you about some other books we've liked recently, including. Michael Roberts, you can't go to Trump's well, you can eat his food in secret ingredients. It's a terrific book. I mean, who ever thought of putting cheese with lamb? But as he does it, it is ambrosia, but wonderful recipes. And he is the chef par excellence of a restaurant called Trump's. Well, it's all in here. Meanwhile, support your local library. Go in, take out a card. Get out some of those records, too. You can rent them at a library of early temptations. And an organization called Riff Reading is fundamental. We'll see you next week. Otis, thank you so very thank much you. for coming.